Welcome to The Docket, presented by Defense Diaries. I am your host, Bob Mata, and there's my beautiful co-host, Ali Mata. What's up, girl? Hey, babe. Hey, all. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're super excited to be back so quickly. Uh, I was Yesterday was a great day for the defense bar, uh, for defense attorneys everywhere in this country. It was such a momentous day. <laughs> Um, I was, uh, thrilled to have been, uh, in that room when it all went down and, uh, it was just, it was, uh, you feel the weight of that room. Anytime you walk into any kind of Supreme court, whether it be state federal, you, you just feel the, you just feel the power. You know, it's the pinnacle of the system, and uh, it was a it was a spectacular day, and uh, obviously, I'm thrilled for the most part with the results. <laughs> Guess you can't get everything in this world, but we got we got what mattered most, uh, which was obviously that uh, Andrew Baldwin and Brad Rosie were were reinstated to the case. Now, what comes next? Um, you know, and Allison, you did a wonderful job yesterday manning the ship with Jay. You guys crushed it. Uh, I'm so sorry that I cut the stream off. Wow. <laughs> it was, was it was, fun. uh, in my very poor defense, I, I had never used StreamYard on my phone. Obviously I, I was trying to find a quiet place to jump in with y'all. And uh, when I was going to get off, it said end stream. And I thought it was talking about for me. Like, why would I be able to end the entire stream from my phone remotely? Well, you probably started it on your account. So you ended it on your account. I suppose. Well, lesson learned. You know, that's the nice thing about this is you guys are all watching me learn through horrible mistakes, whether it be me interviewing Shay Hughes for 40 minutes without hitting live or me sitting there for 40 minutes live and Bill can't get on, Bill Dorsch can't get on, or there's just so many trials and tribulations. Oh, At man, some point. Not, not the Bill Dorsch one, but the one where it wasn't Bill, that there was like this whole other guy that was being interviewed. Wow. Yeah, that yeah, for, for, for 40 minutes, and then I had to ask him to restart it. So, but enough about that. Um, <laughs> I'm super excited to have our guest tonight. Uh, she is half of the power team that uh, brought this thing home for for Rick Allen, first and foremost, for uh, Brad and Andy, and for really, when I say this, it, for the defense bar, it was such a huge day for the defense bar. Um, I, you know, I, I was so impressed by by everything, starting from the Ritz when they were drafted all the way through Mark Lehman arguing that thing and getting, you know, there was, it was, it was a hot room. The judges were coming in hot. You know, I mean, Mark was probably 30 <laughs> seconds in before they started coming at him, you know, and he, and he was able to uh, persevere under intense pressure from, from all the judges. So uh, without further ado, let's bring in the hero of the week. The month, the year, Kara Winicky. What is up, Kara? Hey, How everyone. are you? 
Hold on, I don't have her face point. cut off like that. <laughs> I'm not. I can't even call her either. <laughs> Come on. There. So, What's how that? are you? Are you uh, basking in the glory today? I am because honestly, we didn't expect an answer yesterday. Nobody, I think, expected it. So when I got, I, I had just gotten back home, picked the kids up from the bus, walked in, and and Mark, Mark had called me and said, "Did you get the order?" I'm like, "No, what order?" Yeah. And said, we got. They're back on the case, and I was like, "Yes." So you know, I, I was gonna say I was like at first really hopeful that, you know, this could win. But then when we had you on and you were like, I really don't think so. <laughs> these things, they, and I'm thinking, oh no, what about like structural error and stuff? And so it, it, it definitely made me think, well, she's going to be more realistic about the way the Supreme Court is. So I guess you even surprised yourself. Yeah. And you know, I'm so used to, I, I do a lot of post conviction law where you like, I explain to people, it's like a pyramid, your best shots at trial, then maybe appeal almost never post conviction, forget about habeas. Right. So I, I'm used to having to set expectations for clients and be like, mm, we probably aren't going to win, but let's try. Right. So that's what I'm used to doing. So I was in that mode, like, eh, but yesterday, um, I think after when when the when I keep saying the state when the respondents counsel both of them were up there and the the justices were kind of saying the same things Mark had said about this being a trial run a, a practice trial. I thought we might we might get them back on. I was feeling pretty good. I wasn't sure, uh, but yeah, I didn't think we'd know yesterday. That was just a gift. Yeah. Well, when you yeah. when you texted me, you're like, "Did you see the order?" I'm like, "I said the exact same thing you did." So what order? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, "They're they're back on." I'm like, "What?" I'm like, "They like, they yeah. put out like, what was it like five hours after?" I mean, did Fast that tell you? I've never had. It was well, when you look at it, kind of reflecting back on a lot of the things that the, the judges were saying during the hearing, they really stressed the point that this delay is something that they want done with. You know what I mean? They, they felt like that was something that they really hammered home that, you know, all of this is just delaying justice and just delaying this trial going forward. And they were, they were tired of it. And, you know, it was, it was their position that they were going to do what they had to do to get this thing moving forward. And I mean, they were clearly dead serious, you, you know, um, because when that order came out, you know, and, and when we had talked after the, after the hearing, I mean, that was kind of the feeling I got. I think that we both agreed, look, I think they're getting back on, you know, right. I mean that, that, that I really felt like that. And I think I had said to you, I'm like, man, they didn't bring up, no one brought up, but most importantly, the judges didn't bring up Gull one time, right. you know? So I'm like, I was concerned that she was going to be left on, which of course she was. And for any of you guys out there that aren't aware of what happened yesterday, so there was the, I'm assuming most of you do, but I can't assume that all of you, you do. So yesterday, the oral arguments for, uh, you know, the writs of uh, the writ of mandamus were heard at the Indiana Supreme Court. Uh, Kara and her partner on this particular matter, uh, Mark Lehman, were there in court and Mark argued in front of the Supreme Court and of Indiana. And uh, both sides went. And what, what, what was the time limit on it, Kara? Was it was it 40 and then 10, 30, 10? 30 each side, although. Um the attorney general took about eight. I think she got eight to 10 minutes. And so yeah. the, uh, judge goals lawyer got 20. Yeah. And then uh, ultimately, so once the arguments are over and they were asking for three things, they wanted uh, Brad Rosie and Andrew Baldwin to be reinstated to the case. They wanted judge gull removed from the case and they were asking for a 70 day trial date. And, uh, and that was it. So the arguments were had. The judges skewered everybody, asked all the questions that they wanted. And, you know, we walked out of the room. And later that day, by late afternoon, there was an order in place uh, reinstating.
the old attorneys, Brad and Andy, were brought back on. And ultimately, they denied uh, the writs as to removing Gall and uh, additionally not giving them the 70 days, which I, I want to dig into both of those things kind of right away. In terms of, and, and I had an interesting text uh, with, with Brad afterwards in terms of, and he made a really good point. Like we all kind of need to see the language of the opinion because they are going to issue an opinion on it. And I think in terms of kind of knowing where this case is going to go, like right away, because there is the, and, and clarify for us, Kara, because we're Illinois attorneys. What, what is, what do you guys call the motions to get a judge off a case in Indiana? Here we call it a, substitution of judge or to disqualify a judge we call it judge. we call it a motion for recusal rec usal or um a motion to for change of judge something like that so either one of those i've seen them both ways yeah and either way they go in front of the one judge they go in front of the judge and i i can't remember if i tweeted this out today a lot of people think that's crazy it sounds crazy how can the, how can the judge decide her own bias Remarkably, it works. It works fairly well. We have judges that remove themselves, you know, when asked quite a bit. Uh, they they can somehow sort of step out and see themselves, and see if it looks like the appearance of bias. You don't actually have to prove actual bias; just the appearance of it. We thought yeah, everything I went hand in hand. Um, I, you know, I'm wondering though. So I will say there was a lot of talk about could couldn't she just disqualify them? They get back on. Can't she just hold a disqualification hearing? I don't think so, because they granted the writ on removal, which meant that they agreed by at least a majority, whatever that is, three, two, four, one. Um, they agreed that she didn't have the authority to do that. So I don't think she can do a disqualification hearing at this point of counsel. At least they not might have decided that she didn't have the authority to do it, having not had a hearing, though. Could be, could be. I still, I think that, you know, that was kind of our argument is, listen, even if you assume everything that she alleged they did is true, is that enough to remove counsel? Our argument was no, uh, it wasn't. Because, you know, and and her attorney was arguing a, a very kind of concerning uh, standard, in my opinion. He was saying, you just have to show the possibility of ineffectiveness. Well, you know, honestly, it, any attorney at any one time might look like he he or she could be ineffective. I mean, that's a squishy, squishy standard. I, I knew they weren't going to accept that. But yeah, it, it, we'll have to see what the order is. But I don't think anybody can really act on anything, at least not for disqualification right now, until they see what the actual written decision says. Yeah, that yeah and that was kind of the basis of... of you know, what, what everybody that I was talking to thought as well, just with, without knowing kind of what the rationale was behind things, um, you know, because that was the one thing I was worried about, you know, and, and I, I, we were talking, you know, can they just turn around? Can she just turn around and say, okay, well, now I'm having the hearing. And I agree with you. Not only do I think that she might be uh, blocked by doing that from the language of the opinion when it comes out. But additionally, it's just a bad look at this point. You know, I, I mean, to me, it would seem almost vindictive for her to do it, for it to have gone to that level, the highest court in Indiana, for, for the court to have ruled on it and for her to, her to turn around and try to do it again. Which just, it, it, and we know she's got aspirations to get on that court. You know, I, I think if we look at that, uh, you know, as kind of like the filter in which she looks through things, I, I think that I think that that's unlikely that she'll do that. Now that brings me to Brad and Andy trying to get her off the case. What what's your hot take on that? I think they're going to try, but I think it's interesting because they've got an issue now because they they want to go to trial. They're ready to go. Unfortunately, they kind of had to show their hand right through the Frank's memo and then through some of our filings. They they had to lay out this was what our strategy is. So, you know, now going forward, 
asking for a different judge delays things. It can. And so that's a thing because what if they file this and she denies it? Now what are they going to do? You know, now are they going to appeal it? That's going to hold everything up. So they're not going to want to appeal it. Honestly, my opinion, I, I think, I hope that they'll take some time to think about what they want to do. They can, they're trying this case to the jury. Yes, the judge is very important in terms of evidentiary hearings, but on, or rulings. But honestly, I mean, if they have what they say they have, uh, they can win this case in front of any judge. Um, I mean, uh, you know, if they really, they have, if they have what they say they have or what they've hinted that they have, you know, I, I think a jury will see through a lot of the state's evidence. I really do. I would 100% agree on that. You know, as far as Bob and I are always saying, like, all right, we don't get, once it gets to the jury time, I've had plenty of judges hate me, but it's hard to have the judge not like you during your pretrial motion phase and your motions in lemonade. That's, that's a real kick in the ass there. Um, but you know, I, I, I understand. I, I was kind of thinking like, even in my perspective, like even if I had been ready to go to trial at that point, I feel like at this point I'd need to be reevaluating before just deciding, you know what, I, I still want to go because like you said, some of their strategic plan right. is blown to shit. So, right. you know, you, there, there's not as much of a benefit to him to not that he doesn't want to go speedily, but to do it as speedily right? You know, as, he, as he would have then. Um, you know, one thing that really struck me that had me like almost horrified during the, the hearings was how many of the justices started to say, are you, so is, are you ready to waive his sixth amendment right to in effect? I was like, are, are you shitting me right now? Like, first of all, we didn't even have it get to that level. Like he would, like you guys were arguing, you know, these aren't even the kind of errors that get to there. But for that to be so quick, I mean, like the one guy's like, do you want to have your cake and eat it too? And you, so you're telling me you're not going to waive ineffectiveness. It's like, you know, whoa, whoa, that is a huge ask. I mean, I don't think that I would, I was saying if that were me and that's really the alternative, obviously I'm glad it didn't come to this, but who knows? I have a sneaking suspicion that there might be some language, not that compels anything, but sort of discusses that possibility in the future if things are different in the future. But I don't even like like that kind of wording existing if I'm an, an Indiana lawyer, because so I was saying, I would at that point say to him, you know what, let me help from the background. You, you need your, you, I mean, you're a post-conviction you know, you do post conviction right. work, you know, if God forbid someone's actually innocent and they get, you know, you're, you're never getting anywhere. If you waive those, it's just like a lifeline that doesn't work until it should, you know, until right. it can to be out without um, it. The good, the thing is though, we knew that question was coming. We prepared for it and we prepared for it quite a bit because we knew that the justice that asked that was going, that was going to be important to him. Um, and you know, I mean, from my personal opinion, yeah, I think you do waive it for those specific allegations. If you say yeah, that's hey, not ineffectiveness, that, that exactly. he was saying, exactly. that's what the judge was saying. Absolutely. He kept saying for yeah. ineffectiveness. And that's why I was like, whoa. Well, and I, I understood him to be I think he was trying like sometimes our judge, our justices will ask to try to figure out the contours of our argument. And they also they want to make sure we concede what we need to concede. And I think we needed to concede. Yes. We would waive those particular claims. Yes. And you'll notice that Mark went back up and he hit that on rebuttal and he was very yes. good about being, I, Hey, I missed that. Yes, we concede. And you'll remember that on the other side, there was a concession that should have been made that wasn't made. And that was, wouldn't this prosecutor be under the same, um, I guess, scrutiny uh, that the defense was. And that was a concession that had to have been made. And it, it, wasn't in my opinion. And I think that probably ruffled a few feathers because, you know, and that's the thing. Sometimes I think they want to see where is your argument? Where are the limits of your argument? And it, initially I can see why he thought we were arguing. We wanted our cake and eating it too. Um, but, you know, somebody, I don't remember if the, the chief justice or not said, well, when we let people represent themselves, you know, yeah, that was that was your. Chief and you know what? We do. We let them do that. And they waive their entire IAC claim. They can't raise ineffectiveness right. at all. Right. 
you know, and it's, it's frustrating because we don't advise them that, uh, but they find out later. But I think, it, yeah, I think in this situation, if he, it's not ineffective because, you know, as you know, but even if he sometime down the road wanted to raise that issue, I do, I think he would have waived it at that point. Not the whole claim, just on or that. No, but this is one of the judges, I think it was Slaughter, I'm not sure. He said, all your ineffective claims during trial. I mean, like, he was throwing that out there as, like, in the world of possibilities. Obviously, I see I'm going to waive conflict of interest. So I'm not going to raise conflict of interest in appeal. But, you know, the wrong objection? Yeah, I'm going to be able to raise the wrong objection. You know, that's a good question, though. If you, let's say, let's say you had a, I don't know, an attorney that fell asleep and slept through 90% of the trial and the judge, <laughs> the judge kept stopping and saying, hey, your attorney's asleep. Are you sure you want to keep going? And the client's like, yeah, I want him as my counsel. I think he may have waived it. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but, that, but, but I didn't see that, or maybe that is what he was getting at. To me, it seemed like they were almost saying, if you want us to put him on right back right now, how do you feel about waiving all of your ineffective claims going forward? And I just didn't see how that could possibly be connected. But I, I'd agree if your lawyer's asleep and you tell the person, the judge, yes, I want to go on. Well, you waived him sleeping there, but you didn't right. waive when he was awake, him failing to make some other objection. Right. Right. And so I think, I don't know, I, when we got in the courtroom, I don't know what other people thought. It felt like they were rare. They were ready to go. We're supposed to get two minutes. I don't know how other people feel. I, I don't like the two minute speech time because it feels very, I just want them to start giving me questions. Right. But they, that we didn't get two minutes. They were ready to ask questions. They often also will ask in order of seniority and they did not. Um, and so they were definitely ready to go. They, they had questions and they were ready to start talking. So uh, we, I don't know. I think a lot of it was just them trying to, they might've been talking to each other through their That's questions. Yeah. So yeah, I pointed that out yesterday because, and then we were on with other lawyers and she was like, yeah, but they almost unanimously agreed. And I, I didn't want to be like, well, but you don't know on which issues behind that, that right. they don't, you know, what level of agreement they're at when you're talking about, you know, how all the other things that, that go into that. So, cause to me, that's why I thought that they would uh, you know, one of the reasons, like you said, talking to each other and, and developing the record for like their different, their different points in what's going to come in the brief. Right. And yeah. so do you, based on how quickly that just happened, is it, I mean, is it possible you're going to get a really quick, I just assume that it's kind of difficult that as soon as they got you back in, it'd be fine. But like you're saying, it does sort of tie everyone's hand. So it, how long do you think? I, I think I think I said yesterday at lunch, I thought we'd hear in two to four weeks. I'm still maybe now thinking maybe closer to two weeks or less um, because the order just came out so quickly. And I imagine they won't write a really long decision. I But I'm expecting maybe we have a dissent, at least on, you know, when I was thinking about today, I was like, why would you know, they didn't give us anything else. They just gave us the counsel. And I have to wonder if they're going to say we didn't we didn't ask for it below. Um, you know, we didn't file the speedy trial. We know why we didn't, but we didn't. And we didn't, we didn't file again for the motion to recuse. And so, or either that, or they thought that that needed a full, a full hearing to give the court, you know, the judge, the time to really think about it. That's what I heard because your chief judge said, you can't tell me that the record is insufficient to say that the lawyers were not good enough, but it's sufficient to say the judge should be disqualified. So that sort of answered that question for me yeah. right then and there. Which again, and you I, know. Go ahead, Kara. Oh, Everyone wants to hear you. No one wants to hear me. <laughs> I expect them to, I expect Andy and Brad to quickly file a 70 day. Uh, I think that that's what they'll do. But, you know, honestly, I, I don't know, because now we're back into where they're back on the case. And so I assume they're back under the gag order. Um, and I'm not a member of the team, so I'm not really, you know, they're not going to give me information. And I'm certainly I'm I'm backing out to kind of let them do their thing. And now they're in this interesting pickle where there's actually four lawyers today. So 
I don't know what's going to happen with that either. Um, you know, you've got two lawyers ready to go, two that uh, said that they aren't yet. So I don't know if the two will leave and Brad and Angel stay on. I don't know if they'll ask for a speedy. I don't know what they're going to do. Do you think um, well, I saw counter- Brad and Andy had filed their their appearances already today, but uh, I did not see the corresponding motions to withdraw from Scrumman and Labrado. So, I mean, it, there's I can't imagine your county is going to be willing to pay for two lawyers when there's our you know four. I can't either. I can't either. Well, I, I mean, that, can't Rick just say I'm done with you like any other client does? Like I'm yeah, I'm good. Could. Thank you for your service. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I anticipate that that's what will happen. Yeah, at some point, uh, I think so too. And plus, yeah, why would Allen County taxpayers want to pay? You know, or Carroll County want to pay for two extra lawyers? Right. Doesn't make sense yeah <laughs> yeah I, i'm so i'm and and you actually kind of answered the question that i had which was about the 70 day how does that operate in so what does that rule say in indiana with respect to the speedy trial demand so when you like what what is that rule i'm not familiar with it we have a different rule yeah. in here in illinois yeah, so in you know, you know that we have under the federal constitution and under the our state constitution, you have a right to a speedy trial. But we know it's a very uh, no hardly anybody wins on that issue. You have to have a long time between charging and trial. But in Indiana, we created a rule that says, okay, you've got you've got a speedy trial, and we're going to implement it in this way. And if you are in jail awaiting trial and you want an early trial, speedy trial, you file this motion under Indiana Criminal Rule 4B, the judge is has to give you, shall give you your trial to begin in 70 days. Now, there's a couple of exceptions, but really, it's a pretty hard and fast deadline. And so as soon as they filed it, that would lock them in. They would get priority over uh, defendants who are out on bond, defendants who haven't been in as long, defendants who, um, you know, had misdemeanors, for example, something like that. So that's why I know what they were doing. They had the date. They wanted that date, but they wanted to lock it in and make it so nobody else could bump them. And that's why you hold the 70 day until the 70th day, you file it, you're locked in. Right. Um, it makes 100 yeah. percent sense. And I think because Bob's thing, like here. What if we we just have your typical, you know, speedy trial, you obviously have to file a speedy trial demand for it to start your clock to start running. I mean, technically, even under the federal, they it's there. If we don't assert it every time we go in and agree to a continuance. But in any event, if I file a motion, for example, Frank's motion that tolls it. And if I file something else that tolls it, you know, I've tried to file motions where I say, and I'm seeking to only toll, you know, from like this day until, you know, or I'm waiting for additional discovery on this and I, it shouldn't start to toll until I get it, which right. sometimes I, I don't get. But do you guys have anything like that? It's like you guys can be doing whatever during that 70 days and you're still on a 70 day track. No, things can toll it. Um, and that's what's interesting is, though, that was another reason why I think they waited was because they they were making sure that they gave the court plenty of time to rule on these pretrial. They asked for a, a hard deadline on discovery and they were going to file that motion right before and that would have locked it in. There would be no excuse for why they couldn't go to trial in that 70 days. The, the pretrial motions should have been or might have been decided before trial. If not, they could have done a suppression hearing during trial. We've done those before. This would have been a long Long suppression okay. period for trial. <laughs> yeah, that would have been. Uh, but, uh, you know, and so that's the thing. I think that was the other thing why they were holding it. It makes perfect sense, uh, you know, right. whenever you look back at what their strategy was. No, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I know everybody wants to know and it better. Why not come from a Indiana lawyer who also does appellate law? So your typical uh, motion to change, you know, to add a new charge Explain to the people how that works and what happened here. Well, in Indiana, we have a pretty liberal rule for the prosecutors. They can add charges or amend charges pretty much up to the day of trial. Yeah, pretty much. And I've seen them actually amend it at trial if they have a really good reason. Me too. Uh, And so 
it's interesting. I've been thinking about these charges all day. None of it makes any sense to me why, you know, why they filed them. If you think about it, you if he had gone to trial on the felony murders, the state could ask for the lesser included offense of kidnapping to be instructed to the jury. So he didn't really need to file that necessarily. Um, and the knowing or intentional murder, that just raises his own burden of proof. You know, you got to show that Rick himself did it or was involved in whoever did it, you know, helped him. I, you know, I don't know what I don't know what the thinking is. There's well, let, there, me, let me ask you, because Sleuthy had been asking uh, desperately all day in terms of like the way she's reading it is that with the intentional murder that that he he he's adding or added yesterday, his timing was unusual um that that she thinks that it's linked to uh 3542-4-2 which is you know the kidnapping you know the rape robbery human trafficking do they have to can they prove just the straight murder or do they have to also prove the underlying thing which is really the felony murder part of it anyway i mean to me it just felt like he, he's he's still going to have the felony murder as a lesser included for law. You know what I mean? But like, but the, it does kind of read when I was reading through it as if they've got to prove those elements as part of the intentional murder of either the, the of namely the kidnapping in this situation. Yeah. The, I don't know if that was a typo, the, the subsection two part, because we have like subsection one is knowing or intentional murder. Right. And it's straightforward. Subsection two is felony murder, which we know, which means if you killed somebody, whether you meant to or not, while you were committing a certain felony. And so the intent from the felony transfers to the intent for the murder. Um, so I thought I saw that it said subsection two. And I was like, but it's reading like knowing or intentional murder. I don't know if they accidentally forgot to change that on the template and meant yeah. to say you know, and it, I, I don't know. Because she, I, I she was sending me the, yeah, she sent me the, she sent me both both the motion for leave as well as um, uh, the actual uh, information, and it was, it it, it reads strangely. It, it's like he's got it as. Um, Richard M. M. Allen did kill another human being to wit, uh, victim one while committing uh, or attempting to commit kidnapping, all of which is contrary to the form of the statute. In the case, uh, the case is made and provided to wit, IC 35 dash 42 uh, dash one dash one two mm -hmm. and IC 35 dash 41 dash two dash four. And, uh, you know, and then, of course, that's against the peace and the dignity of the state of Indiana. So, yeah, I don't know. I didn't know how to advise her. I couldn't tell either because, I mean, second, if it's straight murder, um, it's straight murder. Which well, one? Are you, are you reading? Are you reading the actual set, the charge you filed yesterday like that? Yeah. yeah I, count, I one, let me see here. You, so the second one was 354224. Yeah, right. so the the new counts he, he added two counts of murder, one for Abby, one for Libby, and it's uh count one murder, a felony, uh Indiana Code 35 dash 42 dash one dash one parenthetical two and uh Indiana Code 35 dash 41 dash two dash four. I was gonna try to see two dash four what that is. I think Sleuthy Isn't, sent it to me. Let's oh, see. I'm in. Yeah, I was going to try to see what that is because is I can read it to you. Yeah, it's no, it's it's aiding, inducing, or causing an offense, oh, which yeah. means so. Yeah, it's so basically he, accountability. Yeah, so all he's saying is um, that he he doesn't have to be the killer; he just has to have oh. helped the killer with the killing. But again, that's that's what that's what the first charge was. I, I don't understand no, what the difference that, is. Me either. Uh, 
All right, good. So I, I'm glad because I, I couldn't answer it. For well, I mean, it's slightly murder. different in the sense that under the felony murder, you agree to commit the kidnapping, the murder happens, account of guilty. But the other way, if it's your typical accountability, you attach yourself to a group planning on doing this crime, somebody else does it, you're guilty. But that would be them planning that crime as opposed to it being happenstance on a different felony. Yeah, or you know what he could be doing is if he can prove the murder and the kidnapping. So he helped in the murder and he helped in the kidnapping. Definitely. You can get a longer sentence because you can run those consecutive. You can you guys don't have the death penalty. What's that? No death penalty. He he yeah. could get the death penalty. They could have filed this. There are aggravating circumstances that he could have alleged to file it now. Filing a death so. penalty, though, let's let's triple or quadruple the price tag. That starts. And then, of course, you have to find, uh, well, a lot of times you have to find qualified attorneys if you're going to do a public defender. Um, and we have a, a list of them. But, yeah, that's opening a whole other can of worms there, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, guess and you you have murder people, go to Indiana and they'll be too <laughs> lazy to give you the death penalty. I mean, not well, I think, Kara, I, if, Kara whoever actually, is guilty deserves the death penalty. We, we you know, have the death penalty, but we don't use it very often. Right. I think Sounds we've got like, like 10 people on death row. And, you know, most of us who are abolitionists have let it, we've, we've kind of said, you know what, we'll just do de facto abolition. We're just going to do right. whatever we can not to get somebody on there. And let's just forget trying to change the law because the legislators aren't going to do it. They like it on the books. They just don't, you know, nobody cares if we use it that much. I think in <laughs> Illinois... Yeah. Tell me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, babe. It was had to do directly with the amount of false convictions that they're like, we can't risk that when putting people to death. Was yeah, that that's the, exactly what it was? Oh, yeah, yeah you guys had like seven it, people or something exonerated, and like one, quick, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, the it, it's been a while, yeah, because it, it, I think it was Ryan, it started as a moratorium, yes, and it was. uh, it, and then it shifted, you know, to they just got rid of it, but yeah, it was. I mean, that's always the thing because that's a, it's a definitive ending, you know, and like my thing has always been, look, you know, cause the counter argument to, you know, if you really want to punish somebody, you don't kill them. Like to me, there's no harsher punishment than keeping that's somebody in a cage for the rest <laughs> of their life. Like all the little it's things that, that we take money it, that you know, they're take, paying. For right. no reason. Right. Just it's miserable somebody. in prison. Who wants right. to spend the rest of their lives there? You know? And that's the thing. Yeah. Anybody, if, if they're Rick's age that gets convicted, they're not getting out before they pass away. They're not going to live that long. So right. it's like a de facto life sentence anyway. Why why right. make it harder on yourself, you know, by raising your burden? Well, yeah. you did bring up an interesting ponderable, though, because it it, it is, even though it's not employed very often. Uh, you know, I mean, theoretically, McClellan could could say, well, we're seeking the death penalty. And at that point, we don't know, even though Brad and Andy are really in private practice, they are appointed as as public defenders because in, in private practice, you don't have to be death penalty certified right. to handle the case. Whereas if you're a public defender, you do. And we don't know. If like that, that, like Kara brought this up and it was like a, a, like one of those ponderables. I was like, oh my God, like whatever, what happens if, like, what happens if that twerp, uh, McLean does this, you know, I'm like, because theoretically, I don't know if either Andy or Brad are death penalty certified, even though they certainly I don't have. I think they are. I don't think right. they are. Right. So, I mean, that could be like a weird end around way to like bump I mean, If they them really the wanted to get them off. Back. But based I mean, on what Kara is saying is they don't want to do that to themselves either because they would they'd have a very hard time. I don't finding think so. And honestly, wouldn't we all see through it? Would I mean, wouldn't this make everything so much worse if they did? And we would say, we know what you're doing. This is your other way to try to get Andy and Brad off. You know, it's right. it's a it's a pathetic attempt because really what they would do is they would be inviting on uh, people who are. I mean, I know most of the people who are death qualified, they're they're going to come on guns a blazing, riding the Odin spear story on into the truck. I mean, they're going to be, they're going to be Brad and Andy, you know, on steroids. On steroids, right. So, yeah. <laughs> it, the spear of Odin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's just, 
stuff I'm learning it as I go, but yes. Yeah. There's, well, there's, I, I, I remember when you, <laughs> yeah, well, I remember when you came on, you're like, yeah, I would, I didn't know much about Delphi and like what was going on with the case, like kind of the underlying any of the stuff until you decided to take, you know, this upon yourself and, and why did like, just like let people kind of understand like what initially drew you to like, you know what, I, I've got to do something about this. Like, just tell, like, how did you get there? Well, as an appellate attorney and post-conviction, the record, the the docket, as people know it as, that's like the that's like the Bible. It has to be, it has to have everything because if things are filed and I don't know that they're filed. I, I don't know. I can't look at it. I won't know to go see it uh, and review it and things. And so when things were disappearing, the Frank's memo disappearing, that's not how we do it in Indiana. Um, when things were being removed and there was no notice as to why. So as, as attorneys, we have an ethical duty to follow the rules. And the rules say, if you're going to file something, it has to be public unless by law it's required to be confidential. And then you have to do it a certain way. And this was just over and over again, wasn't being done that way. And so um, we we started like when the Franks memo disappeared, like, it, you know, I perked up a bit like, what is this? And and initially, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I was like conspiracy theory. Right. You know, I went immediately there. And then whenever we saw, I think it was Brad's file. Well, we knew uh, there was some chatter in the defense community that the hearing on the 19th was going to be unusual is kind of what we were told be prepared uh andy has a lawyer things might get interesting so i was like oh so we all tuned in and then we were like what the heck you know so that got me wondering and then when brad filed stuff that made sense i think it was almost immediately pulled off or removed or something or she ordered it removed i was like this is just not how we do any of this here none of it uh you can we strike it from the record but it stays on the record um, and so that's whenever I talked to Maggie, who's just the sort of the expert on all of these rules. And she was like, yeah, this isn't right. And so we decided to do something at that point. Um, so let me ask you is because when the new lawyers filed their most recent memo or motion, we were noting how she didn't how she removed or sealed or whatever she did to their affidavit was that something that if you're looking at the record through your lawyer portal, that she's got the right notice there and all of that, or she did it wrong again? Did, and here's the thing. I don't know who did it wrong there. When the clerk was saying that counsel filed it that way, except here's the problem. When I got on to look at it, somebody said, have you seen the new motion? I was like, no, but I knew I needed to look because the chief justice actually asked, said something about it. So I knew, I knew she was paying attention. So I was like, let me go look at it. I just saw a motion. I'm like, oh, okay. I read the motion. I was like, okay. I had no idea there were exhibits attached. I saw they were referenced in the motion, but I thought, oh, he probably forgot to attach the exhibits. You know, we've all done that. Um, and then somebody said, no, there's exhibits. Like exhibits, because they're not, they don't show up. And so again, if I'm the one that had, if I was the appellate attorney and I wasn't paying attention to this case, I got this case, I have no idea he'd attached exhibits, right? And so again, whether he filed it confidential or not, the clerk has to put at least a, a line to show that there it, there were exhibits filed with the motion. That's and still wasn't not the, there. Wasn't the Supreme Court's whatever non-writ, I don't know what you call that opinion, didn't it specifically <laughs> remind everybody like if this is going to happen, you need that disclaimer. You need to do all the other steps and a disclaimer should show on the docket. Right. Now, so the clerk was saying the attorneys did it. I don't know if the attorneys did it or not, but let's, it, okay, if they did, I, I would caution them that they've, they've got to correct that because that's on all of us. We all have to follow those rules. And so we have a duty to correct that. So well, you want to, you, they probably thinking they'd get kicked off. Could, you know, and that's the thing. I don't know if that's what's going on. So, and the clerk saying, it's not, it's not me. And I think when people were inquiring with the clerk, Hey, shouldn't this be on the docket? She deferred to the judge and then the Allen Superior Court, I assume court administrator runs that Twitter, basically said, yeah, we don't have to put it on. 
you know, which was, and I, I think that the administrator meant you don't have to make it clickable for everybody, but no, it's got to be on the docket. That's, what, you know. What does that mean? Though, it's got not to be. <laughs> so we have three forms of uh, access in Indiana. So there's anybody can click on certain links. You mean they, like the public. Sweet. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Anybody can click. And then and attorneys have access. Right. Then there's attorney access, which we have a little bit more. We have pretty much anything public at all. And then there's the confidential that only the parties and the attorneys get access to. Now, um, other people have access to confidential too, uh, clerks, judges, things like that, even in other counties. Uh, but that's those are the three levels. So he was saying, I don't have to put those uh, up there for I only have to put final orders. Well, yeah, you only have to put them up clickable for everybody. But attorneys should have Warriors. access to everything public. Right. And they're not even on the docket. I can't even click on anything. I don't even see it. So it has to be on the docket. That, so that's just, so don't, do you not wonder who it is telling that person to, all right, you're going to take all the steps except actually make it available. I can't imagine the clerks doing that on their own. To me, I'm like, oh, this judge, she's just like, she's still at it. But <laughs> I don't know. You know, and the thing is, going forward, anybody could could ask for it to be corrected and could, you know, the court, the Supreme Court told everybody file in the trial court and ask her to fix it. You know, and then if that doesn't work, you can appeal. Anybody can do that because we're members of the public. So the public is the one who's basically Anyone wrong who lives there. in Indiana, you mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. Or yeah, I guess so. That's probably the, the best person. But, you know, I don't know. I kind of I saw it. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to see what Andy and Brad are going to do with that motion. It's out there. It's on behalf of Rick. I assume Rick wants it. But, you know, I don't know if they're going to add to it or what. It would be wonderful to be a fly on the wall of the first trip to Wabash Valley as Andy and Brad meeting with Rick <laughs> and watching the look. None of your Ricks asked them to move him, right? No, uh -uh, I wish no. you guys would have, in retrospect, thrown that in too because it's like we hmm. wouldn't have gotten it. Well, but maybe no, and, with and them all these delays, it's pending. I mean, yeah. it's pending. It, it was formed by you know, or it was filed by Scremen, but there it's pending. I mean, that that's still pending. You know, I mean, I Gull's know. coming in my back mind, to he's being permanently. He's being permanently destroyed slowly, like but his there's, mind no, there's no question. You it, know well, what? Though? I, I mean, yes. Yesterday, Go when ahead, I called girl. Kathy, his wife, and she was very happy to hear what had happened and very emotional about it, I said to her, well, I hope that this will give Rick hope. He's got the attorneys he wants back on the case. He knows there are people out here fighting for him, even if it's just Andy and Brad, if he thinks those are the only two. He knows that they are. And I, I really think it's going to give him the, the courage and like the just the boldness to, you know, Put up with this a little bit longer. I I feel for him. I do. I mean, he's in a bad way, and I can't imagine. There's probably stuff happening we don't know um, because he's not. He can't tell us when he was on the phone with us. There was somebody in the room, so he's very limited in what he can. You know, he's being watched all the time. This is not normal. This is unprecedented. We have not had this with. I had a pretty high profile person uh, years and years ago. He wasn't treated this way, so. But if you need to communicate, like, and it depends on the, the prison, I know, but I, I've had prisoners who I've had to talk to either for post-conviction petitions or whatever, and their, you know, their counselor is usually in the room or, or just stepping outside the room, like, um, like, so you think they were actually standing still where he could, where the, he could be overheard speaking to you? I'm, I'm almost certain because of the way he was talking to us. It was... Um guarded very guarded like he was careful what he was saying i could i could tell um and that's just yeah i'm used to having people in the room now i thought it was interesting that they they also recorded mr scremen and Labredo doing you know meeting with them because that's what brad and andy complained i've never in my life been video recorded at the i visited clients in yeah. prison and i've never been video taped. No, never never i've never I been taken I understand in that cell i i don't you know None of that's normal. I don't know why the treatment is so, so different. Um, I can only do different prisons. It's like, what, what's, 
What's I right? know. I mean, which that that's the whole thing with this case. You know, I mean is. that is like everything <laughs> has been different about this case, which just leads you down that that conspiratorial road, even if you don't want to go down it. It's just everything from from the date that he's arrived. Well, frankly, everything starting when when the investigation started, you know, has always been super cloak and dagger, super weird. Yeah. And and then when when the arrest finally happens, it just gets stranger and stranger and stranger. And my Did thing something happened yesterday okay, and, with the other guy too, like strange. What other guy? Oh, uh -huh. Mr. Westerman. I didn't hear what he happened. In, I knew we had a hearing, right? I think there was. I don't know if anybody in the chat knows what happened with that. I know that there were some people out there following. He he, he was up on the same day, which again is weird. <laughs> Everything, everything about it is, is strange to me, but all right, let's, let's assume arguendo. Okay. That, that Gull decides for whatever reason to stay on this case, because I keep in my mind thinking, I just don't see why, like, what is she gaining from it? I mean, there are certainly cases where judges sitting on a high profile case that it can really you know boost their career boost their profile they go on to write a book like depending on what they want to do it can be a real boon i just don't see that ever being the case for for judge gall on this case because of the history of it and and frankly in light of the fact that we know from from her past that she definitely She's got eyes on the Supreme Court. She'd eventually like to get there. Now, whether or not she does, I don't know, you know, but but to me, I cannot see the benefit. I, all I can see for her is frustration and just constant bickering with Andy and Brad throughout the entire trial. I just like Alice and I have had plenty of cases at trial in front of judges that were not friendly to us. And you know, as a defense attorney, Kara, it's they typically don't love us. You know, right, we're right. we're not they're they're not like, oh my God, when we walk in the courtroom, come and give me a hug. Or, you know, obviously that's not happening, but like the, even like the civility level in terms of you know their discussion or a comment to us just seems at a different level than when they're talking to the state. That may all be in my mind. You know, and maybe I'm just thinking that, but it, it always feels like that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, like, I, I just don't know what she has to gain from staying on the case when she has a built-in, I feel, when she was elected to the, the chief justice position or chief judge over there, that she has a way to kind of, like, gracefully bow out without it. She doesn't even have to give an excuse why she's recusing herself. But but she could, you know, and like you and I were talking about this yesterday. I said, you know, in my mind, OK, I, I, I'm going to bow out. She doesn't have to say anything. But in this case, I think that people would expect to hear something as to why. And she's got a very convenient excuse there to say, all right, I, I don't think I can afford to be away from Allen County for whatever length of time this trial is going to take, you know, and and I think that ultimately because at the end of the day, we just want to get this trial right. No matter what the result is, we want the trial to be done properly and we want the, the rules of law followed. We don't want to have to be worrying. about. It. I, I just envision like every single day, some kind of like back and forth between the defense and the judge where it's just untenable because sometimes in life and in the law, especially relationships cannot be repaired. And, and and this one, I think, has gotten to that point in terms of you'd hope that, uh, and I'm not saying from Andy and Brad's perspective, I, I think that they'll be able to comport themselves fine. I, I think at this point, they've got to be feeling pretty damn good about the fact that they got put back on. You know, that's a major win for them. You know, so I, I think they're coming in not feeling the scorn that, that, Gull is feeling right now because the, the court has just said, all right, we heard what you said. Sorry, we're putting them back on. So she's got that feeling like, ah, you know, like in, in that kind of antagonism, I think will will.
probably bleed out throughout the course of the trial. What do you guys think? I don't know. Um, you know, she's one of our most experienced trial judges in terms of she's done a lot of jury trials and she's done a lot of high profile ones in Indiana. So I think she feels like, yeah, I can handle this. This is, you know, of course, this is this is a case I can handle because I've handled other high profile jury trials. Um, I don't know. It's a hard thing because I'm not the one in the courtroom. But honestly, yeah, I'm used to judges not liking my position uh you know them thinking my client is not a good person because usually my clients have already been convicted i'm used to this kind of feeling like maybe they're they're never going to rule for me usually i don't see it as a personal thing now i understand things are a little bit different now because you know things were handled differently than than you know i'm not pulled into chambers and and read how terrible i was so i get that but Honestly, you know, this is this is really about Rick. If I had to just put on, you know, pull up my pants and do my, you know, put on the big girl pants and do my thing and just deal with the judge. I mean, they, they're going to have to do that if that's what it takes, honestly. And I think they can do it. And I think she can do it, too. She she can get the trial across. I, I have a personal interest in in a different judge because I don't think she's going to put this on TV. And I would I think this. This trial is a great trial. We have good attorneys uh, with fun facts. This would be an awesome TV trial, made for TV trial. And I don't think she's going to want to do that. But other than that, they can, they can, they can get, they can get him an acquittal with any judge. I agree. That, that's my I, feeling. You, you know, that. and I agree about that. Well, and, that and by I mean, the that's way, a strong I opinion gonna... coming from somebody who's, you know. Been representing Richard Allen, so gonna gonna take that with. And somebody uh, doesn't know much about the facts of the case, but I've seen the <laughs> probable cause affidavit, so okay. It was so then you're that. then you're on par with us, I guess. Yeah. Right. Oh, I, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. that that's you know so and and uh, I've I've recruited Kara Ellis, and I, I I can't remember if I told you yesterday we're gonna we're gonna cover this trial together. So oh, it, it would be amazing. Yeah. It would be amazing. Now we have to realize that Kara has a, a day job like you do. So we're going to have to work around that, but it, like that will be a lot of fun, you know, cause like, I, I'm going to go to the trial. Like I'm going to get in there. I'm going to watch the thing. I'm going to observe it, but to not have it televised would be a real bummer. You know, know. it would be a real bummer. I mean, it, like maybe as a, is a, as an olive branch to the world, Judge Gull will decide to televise the trial. You know, I, I just think that it's it's the type of case that needs to be seen. You know, I, I think that that will right a lot of wrongs by televising the trial, and and I think it would be one of the one of those historic trials that people just talk about, and and the whole world will watch. And I think that uh, I, I think that it it should happen. But I, I agree with you. I think that she probably won't. Just to yeah. be spiteful, you know, but um or she doesn't I don't know. Yeah. Man, TV TV trial judges don't they take it they take a beating on uh, a lot of a lot of comments and things. So she may not want to subject herself to that. I don't know that she'd care what people said, but then again, that's I don't know, dealing with all that every day would be uh still I I do. I I mean that's why I would like to see it televised. I'd be perfectly fine if it were televised if she stayed on and Brad and Andy, you know, the power dynamic has changed now a little bit, right? Because now I don't know how going forward anything else in this case can be secret at this point in terms of filings or anything, because that was one of the things that that we thought was important about the actions was that the reason we have leaks and all of this stuff happening is because everything was secret. And if that if everything had just been treated like the case should have been treated from the beginning, and I'm not talking about not having a gag order. I understand having a gag order, but if if everything else proceeded properly, we wouldn't need leaks. We wouldn't have people wanting to see, you know, disgusting photos or whatever. It would just be like they would just be, you know, taking in and reviewing everything like everybody else would along the way. And quite frankly, that's all right, because they, these people, the, the government acts on behalf of us. 
they're we delegate authority and then they act so we have a right to know what they're doing and i'm not saying everything has to be public but but we have a right to know what information they have to hold them on and what you know what the defense has or has found out if the defense is being treated fairly you know that's part of the frank's motion the motion to suppress we have the right to know those things and keeping it secret does nothing but breed this you know so um hopefully going forward everybody knows that all eyes are still on and we're we're paying attention to the docket a lot closer now and also, you know, I, I think that Andy and Brad are, are going to, I, I think they'll see some things that they're going to do differently. And um, I, I don't know that it's going to be quite the same, uh, quite the same proceeding. I'll be interested to see how it goes. Yeah, I think, I think as we progress through the pre-trial phase, I think that, that Brad and Andy will probably reel it in a bit, but I anticipated yeah. trial they're going to be coming full bore, you know, and they're, they're two very different personalities, you know? So I'm like, I'm really yeah. anxious to see how they operate, you know, cause Alice and I are, are very similar personalities. We're both yeah. very aggressive lawyers, you know? So like when, when people are, are, you know, sitting in the gallery, in one of our trials are getting a lot of Mata and we're coming in hot all the time. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it, you know, where it, maybe it would have, have, you know, aided us sometimes in terms of like good cop, bad copying it, where you got the one, the one lawyer coming in hot and the other one's all calm, cool and collected. I don't know, but we're like Allison and I just operate how our, our DNA tells us to. So, you know, like, like yeah. neither one of us can like kind of pocket that, like we're both just very uh, emphatic people. You know, like, and, and we practice emphatically, um, you know, and you some, some people don't like that. even keeled. Like, I, I definitely think that as far as appealing to a jury, you've got obviously just from the get go man and a woman. So you've, you've got that going, you know, different people for whatever reason. And then I still think you come off more even keeled, but yeah, if we're in front of a judge and especially if he's coming at like, me or us, and Bob's just like he he's can't he can't be controlled. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and when we were we didn't even talk really about who was going to do the argument. As soon as we got the argument uh, call out, I was like, Mark's doing it. Um, and I had been thinking about that for a while. I knew I had an oral argument coming up, but I you know I use that kind of like as an excuse. I still thought Mark was was the one to do it because he is much more passionate. Like he's he's more animated. I'm much more subdued. And I thought, you know what? This case doesn't need a subdued person. It needs someone who's going to be animated. The judges will be okay with that. They're not going to be, you know, put off by it. And I'd seen him argue before. And so I, I definitely, yesterday, I, I was when I was watching the argument, I was like, that was the right decision. I, I, I'm not second guessing that at all. So. I thought there was a lot he did less. A wonderful job. He did. He did a great job. I just thought there was a lot less, like, analysis of case law and applying the case law than I would have expect to see or hear. Although your chief judge really did come at Gull's lawyer, like, <coughs> you know, he, she, she nicely told him the first time. She nicely, she nicely told him the first time, you know, I don't quite read it the way, you know, you're reading it. And then when he's back at it again and she's like, you know, do you have another case to cite? But in general, I didn't hear like, you know, well, if you're looking at this case, how do you overcome blah, blah, blah? You know, like that there wasn't as much. That was because it's an original action. We had actually our second moot that we did and moots like a mock oral argument. The second one that we did, um, one of the amicus writers, Joel Shum, put together a panel of some of the judges, some of the justices, old clerks. I mean, you don't get anybody better than the people that that help them research and write. Wait, and you guys were able to get the clerks to the judges to sit on your mock. The old, they're old clerks. Oh, they're old clerks. For them. Yeah, I was like, wow, that's I want that. Oh yeah, and they the old were clerks is definitely if you can't get the present ones, which you can't. Right. 
you can't get anything better, like you said. No, and they they really every single question we got from the justices we had covered in one of the moots, and so we wow. knew it was wow. coming. Yeah, and so one of the clerks had told us now, you know, this is an original action. They're going to want to just make it very narrow to only this case, only these facts. So how are you going to kind of keep them? You know, you want to give them the most narrow path possible for you to win. And we had really worked on that. And that's why not a lot of law came up at all, because we knew this was going to be very fact based. They weren't going to want to set some big precedent. Um, the Indiana Constitution question, we knew it was coming and we were prepared for that. And, you know, so as Mark said, you know, really, we, we it, this wasn't the time to set uh, new law or to make new law on the Indiana Constitution. He's absolutely right. If we were on appeal, we would have argued this a lot differently. Um, there would have been a lot more law. But in an original action, it, we knew it was going to be a very narrow remedy. So, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was, I, I thought he did an amazing job with it. And, you know, it's like trying to, so how many, how many moots did you guys do? Like just yeah. give people an understanding, like building up to something like this, where there's this much on the line, like you weren't arguing, but how, how stressed were you going into the yeah. day? Were you like, were you like out of your mind straight? Like, just try to explain to people like what it's like. Cause I don't think that people understand that you guys were doing moots in order to try to anticipate what questions are going to be coming at you. Cause we were trying to explain to everybody, this is not like watching a trial. This is right. the judges are hammering the lawyers with questions and it's going to continue like that for the entire hearing or the entire argument. So what were you feeling going in and, and how did you guys prepare for it? Well, when, when, if we were new lawyers doing this, we would have probably done four or five moots, but Mark's done, I don't know, six or seven in front of the Supreme court. I've done a handful in front of the Supreme court. We're, we're used to being in front of the Supreme court. So I didn't need help or he didn't need help with deference, how to answer questions, how to deal with pauses. You know, they tell you it's supposed to be like a conversation. You got to learn how to be conversational. We didn't need all that. What we needed was for people to look at it with, with, you know, fresh eyes and tell us. Yeah. And we needed people who knew the justices that might be able to tell us what we, what they're going to be most bothered by or interested in. So we did two moots. One was three hours. I think the other one was two. Um, and then Mark and I did a brainstorm ourselves where we kind of talked, I don't know, maybe an hour or two. Um, Mark pretty much put his practice on hold, I think, for two weeks and just did this. And and then, of course, when we were writing, I think we both were were doing that for a, at least a week or so, um, just constantly, you know, talking back and forth and things. So it took a lot, but a lot of it, thankfully, we weren't new at this. So we didn't have to take as much to to actually do the argument part of it. Uh, we knew how to do that, some of the basic stuff. But the the hardest part is, at least for me anyway, as I was thinking when we were filing, I was like, what if the justices are pissed? You know, what if they're just mad at us? We're, we're filing not one, but two of these. They hate these things, right? They're, they, they're heavily disfavored. Uh, and we've not only filed one, we're now coming at them with a second one. And I was like, I've lost, I'm going to lose all my goodwill with that court. They're going to be like that, you know, she's, she's crazy. But I, I guess they weren't so upset. So I'm happy about that. You know, there's always that. Because if you go in front of the same court over and over again, you know, that that's what I try to explain to clients all the time. You can't pull fast and loose with the same judge you're in front of all the time. You have to build, um, you know, you have to build a rapport and you have to let the judge know that he or she can, you know, trust what you say. You're credible. Um, you're not going to not concede things. You're not going to get outrageous. And so I was worried a, a little bit about that, but you know, once it was granted, once it was given oral argument, I thought, okay, we're not, we're not nuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, as soon as your chief judge, cause I've been like screaming Gonzalez from day one, as soon as she said Gonzalez, I was like, all right, so there's that. But do you think as far as, um, damn it, I, I had something in mind that I wanted to ask you about why the judges did it, that I just disappeared um disappeared from my mind 
But All right. So gonna... while you're thinking yeah. of that, and I'm sure it'll come to you right in the middle of my sentence and you'll interrupt me. So it'll be, it'll I know be I'm fine, which I'm giving, you a free, I'm giving you a free pass to do that. So as far as like, who do you think dissented? Like if you had to guess, because I like when I was kind of watching and that was the neat thing from from being and, and Kara, thank you so much for getting me in uh, and getting me in the reserve seat. It was you made you made my year. It was such a wonderful gesture, and I'm, I'm so thankful. And I was so happy to have been there for all of it, um, especially getting the outcome. Front row, yeah. too, right? Man, it was so good. It was so good. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, but I remember like, when question. I was. Go. Do you remember it now? You sure? Go. Yes, of course. Okay. So do you, when the judges are, when you're talking about the concessions, are the judges, you think, doing it, like you said, to test your limits and to see how much faith they can put in your arguments? Or because I kind of thought they were doing it like, check, you just conceded that. So when I write my opinion, I can say an argument, you know, counsel conceded. For example, they asked the attorney general, can we start with the presumption that you have a right to the a, a continuity of counsel? And she said, yes. Um, so which do you do you really think it is? Well, you know, I know Justice Slaughter in particular, I think, has a thing about concessions. He wants to. And, and I think that that's a he he used to be a practicing appellate lawyer um, at one of the big law firms. So he would know definitely how important it is you concede what you need to because if you don't they're gonna right. they're gonna question they're, they're question your credibility right and so i think that's important to him to get uh okay do you understand where you where your concessions are here and you know so that especially that's where a lot of those concession questions come from is from him um and he's also he and justice massa both i think are that in Indiana, we think we, we love our post conviction process. We talk about it because, you know, we act like nobody else has one, I guess. Uh, and so we, <laughs> we sometimes I feel like we do. We act like no one else has one. Uh, but we like to think that it's the, the miracle worker. Uh, you know, if you don't get justice anywhere here, you'll get it in post conviction. So a lot of times they want to know, you know, they really rely heavily on that that avenue of relief. And so I think they want to know, okay, well, are you saying, you know, is this something we were definitely worried about whether to concede that, yes, he's going to waive some of his post-conviction claims and is he okay with that, that sort of thing. So they're always kind of looking, you know, a little bit out of just this case to what are you trying to say, you know, going on down the line. But um, yeah, you know, <laughs> Some you had asked about who I thought might dissent. I don't know, honestly. Um, Which judge is the fourth one down from the chief judge? So Justice faith Holbrook, facing the us. Judge. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you're if you were looking at the court, um, right? Yes. Justice Moulter was sitting just right next to the chief justice. He's the newest justice. Uh, he was not at the very end, so he was the. He has dark brown hair. Is the chief judge youngest? Not the, he looked Rush? to be the youngest. Rush is your chief judge. Justice Ru Chief Justice Rush is the chief judge, and she sits in the middle at the third spot. And then Justice Moulter was at the fourth spot um, from oh, the I left. Know. I think the way the cameras were going, maybe I, I ended up. Well, not you're, you're, you were watching it in in like a mirror image, so it's going to be the opposite for you. So oh, like Kara and I being so, in the okay. courtroom. So, so yeah, then the for, one with no hair, is that who you're referring to? No, he was a younger guy, I think. The one on the very end was Justice Goff. Was he kind of quiet? Kind of he was one, The one that was quiet next to him, maybe. Okay, so the one next He's, to him. Was, so, okay, he asked a question yeah. that was at first, I thought, like, oh, this is him saying it was, what's to keep her from just doing this again. Like you just go back and then she does it again. And at first I was taking that to mean like, if she's just, a, you know, like adamant and she's just going to do what she wants regardless. But then he asked a follow-up question after that made me think he was really just saying he wanted it to happen again. So I just, I wanted to be able to ask you what you thought his opinion was, but I'm just not sure which guy you, you know, We're kind of wondering if maybe he He's the dissent. It, so Justice Moulter's our newest uh, justice on the court. He's he's um, you know pretty young in terms of 
judges, you know, just by age, but his dad is a judge. And so I imagine growing up and I think his dad is still on the bench. So I, I can imagine growing up, he got to hear some stories, see some things. So, you know, he's almost like a trial judge in a way, or has that kind of experience. Um, so, you know, I mean, I thought it was an interesting question. Yeah. What would stop a judge from doing this again? But we, I, I think the question that I was wondering if he was maybe the dissent, he had asked, I believe, if if we wanted them back on as public defenders or as private counsel. And I was like, oh, I hadn't even thought that that was going to be a problem. Um, I did. You know, yeah, I did. We were like, oh, you know, we thought they would clearly see the violation happened when they were public defenders. Well, and they did. And they yeah, did. We just, had, yeah. we just had somebody who, and then I realized you know, afterwards, I was like, all right. Now I see why they did it because they didn't want right. to give them that easy path because they wanted them. But that was my fear was like, oh, my gosh. But what if they don't see it as clear as I think they right. should see it? But luckily, you guys did. I know you guys did because we discussed this a lot of research before making that decision. <laughs> and I was telling everybody that even though I was nervous about it, they made the right decision because you guys, at, like you told me, you were confident that it doesn't make a difference for Richard Allen's rights. His, it, you right. were it, for him, and you needed to give them. You, you needed not to give them that softball. And since you were so confident they'd see this track, it made the most sense, and it, it ends up being better for the defense bar overall. But you guys, yeah. had to put in, I know you guys put in a lot of time to make sure it was the best. Yeah. We did. And those are things, you know, as trial lawyers, sometimes you've got to pick an option A or B and you you take one of them and you hope that it was the right one, but you're not going to know until after it's all over, see how it played out. And so yeah, there's a little bit of that there. So, yeah, I don't know who the dissent will be. Honestly, we, we had a really hard time figuring out how we try to predict where the judges are and we had a really hard time trying to well, figure out what is it do you think it's someone who's just going to lay their hat on you should have gone to an interlocutory appeal possibly or uh yeah yeah i think so uh, to maybe me that would be the best that. descent though right i mean like to me that's right. that would be the the easy the softest blow to land if like just i don't even think y'all should have been here i think you should have taken this you know to interlocutory Plus, appeal i think their, that you had a remedy there you right. know Plus, it helps protect their whole thing where the guy was like, oh, you're going to open this water again? Have everybody with their Sixth Amendment problems coming up <laughs> in here. I'm thinking you're talking about the biggest, you know, and then I was that Slaughter who was like, yeah, thanks for looking out for us. But we we got this. <laughs> it was either <laughs> just Slaughter or Massa. Massa, I think, said it made the joke, which was like, but we're all here. Shouldn't we just, you know, decide it? You know, that kind of thing. Um, no, the floodgates question, or or I think that's the argument that the judge's lawyer made, that these are going to be floodgates opening if you let this. No, actually, the floodgates, if you let judges remove lawyers, right. you know what my clients are all going to do? They're going to start saying, my my lawyer was grossly negligent, right? <laughs> I mean, they, they read this stuff. They pay attention. They're going to be, if they want some public defender off, they're going to ask for a gross negligence hearing, right? I know. Uh, it's like yeah. the craziest thing yeah. ever. Because yeah. we were on, like I said, with these other lawyers last night, and one of them said something like, well, you know, something about having notice or something. And I was like, but notice of what standard of, uh, is there a valid standard of law? And he was like, well, I don't think that was a valid standard of law. I'm like, right, exactly. Yeah. So what, because if that's the standard of law, like you're saying, you know, we're going to have, you know, they're, they're, they're going to have, especially the, uh, the appellate court here and all the post conviction appeals from summary dismissals by everybody and their mother. Um, well, and if you heard that the, the judge's lawyer was arguing that the standard should be intuition and experience of the judge, what? and I'm like, oh, gosh, that's just like you're opening up. The, that's a floodgate opening because, the you know, here you're going to have a defendant. Uh, according to your intuition and experience, your honor, this guy can't represent me. You know, I 95 percent of the lawyer removal cases it it's where you know the client doesn't like his public defender and wants a new one and we we're adamant you don't get to pick your public defender you just don't right but, you and know that right. we that, like if that was the issue there'd probably be i don't know how many judges that wanted to get rid of me on one of my <laughs> it was like a federal 
sort of like a federal murder case that got booted out of Cook ends up and they're carrying, you know, they're going on the fact that that serial number has to be parts are made in one state, parts are made in another. There was a weapon. Now it's federal. So in any event, right. my client was just like beside herself. Right. And she's, you know, from a very, you know, poor area, uh, it, like the whole, all the, this was a huge big gang thing that underlied it. And at some point they said something and she gets up and she's like, you lying on me and da, 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 da. And like, so the, the, uh, the judge did whatever. And I, I can't remember, but in closing, I said, you know, um, and it's not for you to, to think about why somebody hasn't testified. Maybe it's because they're emotionally unstable. Maybe it's some other problem. Don't think that that's, you know, and then the judge calls me over and she's like, Oh, you just commented on her not testifying. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, yeah, I know because in this situation, it actually made sense and played in, but she was like, did you, you need to talk to your co-counsel about this. What is wrong with you? And, uh, she got not guilty. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. That's why you said you opened up Bob with, uh, like the defense community was like, you know, rallying. And I think people, it's hard for people who don't do criminal defense work to understand that, you know, when we do public defense, we get paid by the state. And a lot of times clients will say to you, oh, you're a public pretender, you're paid by the state, you know, you work for them, that sort of thing. But that's the whole thing about it. the the line of independence between us and the system has to be a bold, bright, solid line. Especially you, for public defenders, for yes, sure. Because we are the check on the judge's power and the prosecutor's power. And if judges can get us removed or prosecutors can get us removed, which it sounds like, you know, it was, it was judge goals motion, but it wasn't like the prosecutor hadn't talked about it. If they can get us removed, that is scary. We are there. We are the only check at this point on that, that power structure. And if you make it so that we can be removed, you know, good, good luck. Uh, that's, that's, a bad, bad place to be. So for sure, I feel like it, it was pretty good. Now, Chelsea here says that uh, Rosie's DP qualified. That may be possible. The the uh, list I looked at was on the Public Defender Commission's website, not the Council, the Commission. And it could be outdated. It could be wrong. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't. I I mean, I wouldn't put anything past McClelland at this point. Yeah, like to me just trying to figure out the timing of him filing that on that day right. seemed desperate and kind of reeked of desperation to me. Like, Hey, look at me over hey, here. You know, you're all paying attention. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't right. know. There is, don't forget about there me. Was we also yeah, had I, one of the detectives in the courtroom. Did you know that? I did not. Bob uh, mentioned it. I thought that was strange too, but was it the one Cause there's one guy that was like yes, investigating yes. the backstory, but was this that guy or this was not that guy? This was one who uh, I think was mentioned in the Frank's memo and um, is involved with the Purdue professor who may or may not the, the missing Purdue professor, right. Who wasn't <laughs> missing at all. That guy. Yeah. He just didn't so, say what you told, what you said. He said, <laughs> right. Apparently yeah, there's no ramifications for that. Yeah. It's like, that's the kind of thing that I don't get. Where's the ramifications for that? Like, well, you know, that is... that's, a, that's a very good question. And I don't know if that, I can't, it's been a while since I read uh, the memo, but I don't know if that was really fleshed out, if, if they had actually had an opportunity to present all of that yet as to what was going on. I know that they were anticipating filing something before their removal. And so I expect we'll we'll all find out what here soon. Well, I mean, um, let that guy get on the stand. I mean, his credibility will be pretty much. I mean, I'm guessing he's, at this point he'll be able to come up with something at least. Like, well, I misunderstood the guy, or I took it to mean a different way. And in my opinion, this is what he was saying to me. But this is, if I'm the prosecutor, I don't ever want this thing to go to trial because I've got two groups of cops, right? One cop, one group that went one direction one group that went the other, they're going to all be called as witnesses on one side or right. the other. And this jury's going to be like, my gosh, you know, we've got, you know, uh, dueling cops here in terms of their theories of this case. 
Uh, I just right. don't see how how you get over reasonable doubt. But, you know, again, yeah, the prosecutors made clear they haven't showed it their hand. They've got holdback facts they're not sharing. Well, yeah, I'm I hoping mean, maybe you share them with the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we know from the memo. <laughs> I mean, what we know from the memo is that they don't like they couldn't find any kind of connection, you know, with Rick to the girls on any of his devices. Like, right. like to me, after reading the PCA and, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, all right, well, they got mere presence. And then they've got four eyewitnesses that are all giving different descriptions of the individual they saw in terms of height, right. clothing, like all of them are different. And, and then they've got this unspent casing. Yeah, like, well, but like, so I'm thinking they're charging them, assuming that they're going to find the link that drew the girls out to the bridge that day. Because in order for the state's theory to work, you have to, like, it, it has to be, if it's true, and I have no reason to believe that it isn't, since Brad and, and Andy put it in the memo, that they have no, there was nothing found on any of, any of Richard Allen's uh, electronics. And, Apparently he kept everything like he had the old phone drawer that we all right. have, you know, like I've, I've got the phone drawer with all my dead phones that I didn't trade. Cause back in the day you didn't trade in your, your old flip phones and your clacky right. button stuff. You know, it's like you kept that, but he had everything and they didn't find anything on his computers, tablets, phone, nothing. So that, that, what that brings us to is that Rick Allen, if it's Rick Allen just happened to go out to the bridge that day with murder on his mind and just happened to run in to these two girls and just decided to kill them. Because if there's no link drawing them out to the bridge, I just don't see how it happens. You know what I'm saying? So I, you know, and they've always said that even after the arrest, we're keeping the tip line over. We're not saying that he's the only one who did this. There's other people that could be involved, you know? So yeah. And to go into, to dovetail into exactly what you were saying. I mean, you do, you have these three cops that weren't a part of the unified command that very much went in a different direction. Actually, they stayed on the initial direction when unified command decided to, to move off of it. They continued on with it. Now, I like I had my PI find out that the professor lives in Chicago. So I of course emailed him immediately. <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey man, uh any chance you want to talk to me? I'm a podcast guy, but I'm a lawyer, you know. So it's like he didn't get back to me. Um let I, me I ask you guys this. No, no, sorry. Go, go knock on his door. No, what what do you got? Um as far as his devices, to, to me, like, I can't imagine that the human being who committed this offense wouldn't have from, you know, just common knowledge of that, that people have gotten over the years. But even being a lawyer and knowing, I mean, that person's going to have oh. either pornographic or some, something illicit that feeds this underlying drive that makes you do some horrific crime like this, you, you know, like even who, whoever seems the most, you know, average killer that does sick things where we weren't able to get in everybody's, you know, everyone didn't have computers back then. Right. They were doing something. They were either watching, you know, people be injured, you know, do something. There was just there's something that, underlying me, that's, you know, that they're they're either trying right. to to tamp down their urges or whatever the case may be, or building and up. They're feeding them food. some other way. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, so but and it's it, like, there doesn't it, appear to be any of that. Yeah. You know, me, so I, I, I don't know. You, know, you hear two girls, two younger girls murdered i mean obviously especially in the air you know in the field of law we do i automatically thought okay this was had a sexual component uh and there was some sort of an assault and they <laughs> and whoever did it had to kill the girls so they would not tell right i mean and then to hear that there wasn't any sexual component i'm like well that's odd uh, right but there's know, transfer of blood and clothes and all these other i don't care to me it's that is ritualistic right for whatever you know like 
it, it, at least, you know, I was thinking, okay, so if that's not the motive, what the heck, you know, because I don't know a lot of people that just go out and kill. Uh, mostly they think they have a reason, uh, whether it's, you know, to satisfy an urge or they don't like the, there's always something usually. Um, and so right. then I'm thinking, okay. And then you start hearing sort of weird details in some search warrants that we did get to see early, you know, before the arrest. And then all of a sudden, you know, then, then we get the memo and I was like, holy crap, I, that's a possibility. Right. So, well, you know, a hundred percent because serial killers don't have a motive, like what you were talking about. Like there's jealousy, there's, uh, you know, like money, all the all the typical motives behind murder, and, and this one doesn't seem to have it, which no. then leads you to this was somebody who was, if it's the serial killer type situation, and if it's Rick Allen, well, he sure stayed dormant for five years after committing <laughs> this horrific crime. You know, we don't get any other crimes that take place. I know there's the flora you know, the Flora 4 with the fire that took place right. that a lot of people think might be connected in some way. But in terms of you, you didn't have any other cases, even in the area of, of young girls, you know, having the same thing happen to them. So I like, it just doesn't fit for me. Like it, it's never fit for me. And it's, it's coming from a place like I, I know quite a bit about deranged people, like, you know, that do right. deranged, horrible things. And, and, he just doesn't fit the profile for me, you know, notwithstanding the, the weakness of the PCA, because we don't right. know what other evidence they have. I, I would assume, you know, but Nick's digging in, he's doubling down. He doubled down yesterday with this thing. And it was just but a really you know, strange it, move. Yeah. And in his defense, what else can he do? Right. I mean, he's kind of pot committed at this point. In this case, I feel like he, sh you know, if, if he didn't think that there was enough evidence to go forward, I would hope that he would dismiss. But, you know, that's the thing at this point. Um, he, he's kind of in a pickle, too. He can't really it, it wouldn't. I mean, I feel like this has to go to trial. This is the only way this can end. Uh, oh, because yeah. Yeah, because certainly Unless they changed their mind and dismissed the charges. Yeah, I just don't. <laughs> I don't see that, but I don't I mean, know. Presumably, <laughs> if he if he is the guy, because we Bob and I don't know, right? We just know that right now there does not appear to be the right evidence. And like you're saying, we, we've been saying there's these things that just don't check about right. the way the crime happened and the the way you're saying this happened. But you know, if there is a shit ton of evidence out there or something happens then and they have the right guy, well, then you could definitely maybe convince that person to plead out. But obviously it doesn't seem like that. You right know, now. and that's the thing when the, when the probable cause update first came out, I was like, okay, maybe they're holding back. They're only putting in their probable cause, which we all know is a very low standard. Right. Maybe they're only putting in a few things just to get over that burden, you know, that that threshold. And and they're they've got a bunch of evidence in the background. But, you know, then I mean, that's why I think the Frank's memo was such a turning point uh, for the case, because, you know, there was a lot of pretrial publicity. The media ran with the probable cause affidavit. It, you know, I don't know it, what you guys were hearing, if you were hearing anything up there, but in Indiana, I mean, the guy had been tried, convicted, sentenced, and was shipped off by that point because they had concrete evidence of his guilt, this bullet, right? And so, you know, a lot of people don't know that's just crap science. I mean, I can't say anything like it's just junk, um, but they, a lot of people think it's good, good forensic science, right? So they thought, oh, they've got him. You know, that's just like DNA. And so um, when that was just the, that was on repeat for days and days. So they had to come out with that press release and then everything stopped after the press release. Nobody got to say anything else until that Frank's memo, you know, we had some stuff about his, his custody, but you know, that, that didn't really have a lot. I thought it was weird because I knew how the prisons work, but nobody, that didn't really raise any suspicions. But then that Frank's memo, you're like, Oh, wow there's a whole other story here. We're not, we don't know anything about. So right. I, yeah. And I, like, I, I just know that in prisons, look, 
if people don't have the understanding that what happens with pretrial detainees when they're obviously they're typically supposed to, as they're supposed to be in jail, not in prison, but either way, they're the the state is always either putting operatives in there. They'll put they'll put in uh, you know undercovers in the cell, you know, as a roomie in order to try to elicit confessions. They're always always trying to get these guys to talk. And and when you look at this case in terms of look at the strength of the PCA. Now they weren't holding at that point. They were not holding back any kind of bombshell evidence because they're going to want to put their best foot forward because that is the state's theory of the case at the time. That is going to be the running narrative up until trial goes on because they had no way to anticipate that Brad and Andy, that, that was when I fell in love with those two guys. When they started doing what I've been saying that defense attorneys should be able to do all along, why is it that we live in a world that the state gets their theory and that's all it is? A right. probable cause affidavit, that's all it is. I, I don't want to get on one of my 10-minute rants, but that's all it is. They weren't there. Right. Nick McClellan wasn't there. None of the right. cops were there. Holman wasn't there. None of the cops were there. So they don't know what happened. They're looking at the evidence that are coming up with the theory, and that's that. And typically, the way that it goes is the defense stands mute up until trial. They don't say a word. You know, and in this case, it was different because right before the gag, which is the first thing that pissed Gull off and forced her to put the gag in place is they wrote that letter saying, all right, well, this is what the state said. And this is what our side of it is. This is our theory of the case right there. And then they they doubled down with the memo and then they brought out their entire theory of defense or potential theory of defense, which just is very unusual. And, and it's, right. you know, frankly, it's, it's, it evens the playing field. I have zero problem with it. I think that it's the way it should be. If, if the state gets the opportunity to put out their theory of a case, the defense should have the exact same thing because then you're not dealing with the entire public just feasting on one idea, right. one theory, which is the way it always is. So, you know, from that perspective, but, but knowing that and, and just understanding the weakness of that PCA. If you don't think that the state and or law enforcement is trying to squeeze a confession out of Rick Allen, knowing the weakness of their case, and after they realize that they've done the search of the house and they've gotten his electronics and they don't find anything on there, it becomes incumbent upon them to get this guy to talk. If people don't think that that is a, a distinct possibility that these guards not even in a in a in any kind of way in in some kind of conspiracy with anybody where they're working or they're working on somebody saying hey you got to do this but just on their own accord knowing how it goes trying to squeeze a confession out of Rick Allen by coercing him or threatening him or his family if they don't think that that's a possibility then they just don't know the realities of what goes on in prison because I'm I'm here to tell you it's very real and it happens all the time all the time. So, and you know, I, for me, yeah. I would say, I don't know if people know either, but um, in Indiana anyway, prosecutors have it set up to where when a defendant makes a jail call, uh, they get they can actually get an alert. Oh, you know, such and such has made a jail call and they can immediately listen to the jail call um, because all of those are recorded. Defendants are told, you know, they're going to be recorded and monitored. And so those are things... You know, I I expected that they thought he would probably go in and confess to somebody on the phone or say something incriminating on the phone or he would confess to, you know, somebody in the in the prison or something. Yeah, I'm I'm certain that they were expecting it. In fact, I said after reading the probable cause update, I was like, you know, they, this isn't enough if this is all they have. They're gonna need like a confession or something. And I assumed that they had facts they were holding back and that eventually he would he would admit it. And there would be a plea and we would, you know, case closed, we're all good. Uh, and it just didn't go that way. Um, and, you know, as a defense attorney, I you got to love to see it, though, because there's nothing you enjoy seeing more. Not that there's somebody, you know, not getting prosecuted, but that there are attorneys who are putting in the work to check everything that the state says, because unfortunately, we see a lot of that where 
attorneys won't do that work. Well, they'll just accept what's said in a probable cause affidavit. You know, they won't look into ballistics and all of that. And, and people get convicted that way. And that's why we have people wrongfully convicted a lot. Um, so to see it, two lawyers get in there and just work the hell out of the case, really, and and yep. look at every angle. I mean, it's sometimes it's just a nice, it's a beauty to watch, right? <laughs> Man, I, I was, you know, it, it was like, I just felt a kinship to him because that's exactly how Alice and I handle our business. You know, it's like that, that was, as soon as I saw what they were doing, I immediately had a massive amount of respect for them because that's how you're supposed to defend a case. And, and I say it all the time and, and the way that they're operating is that's how you defend the case when you believe that your client is actually innocent, factually. Right. Right. You know, like this, this isn't them trying to beat out a, a, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt type thing. This is like, holy shit, our guy is innocent. Like we're, we, we've got it. Like, because then my father always said it's the worst client in the world you could ever have is the, the actually innocent person right. because it puts the weight of the world on your shoulders as the attorney because it all hangs in the balance and it's all on you. You know, yeah, and if that if that guy goes down, you know better than most as an appellate lawyer, Kara. It's like you're, it's it's a, a Herculean task to try it to is. get them out. You know, and it, and it's like, and you just feel terrible, like forever. It's like you never shake it as a lawyer if you have a guy that you believe is factually and actually innocent go down on on your watch. It, it's it, you just can't shake it. You know, you just can't. Yeah. It never goes away. It's just constant. So, you know, I, I just realized immediately that that what these two guys were doing, that they believe him, you know, they believe him completely, you know, and, and who's going to know better than they are, you right. know, because I've seen like I, I've, I've seen lawyers that do their job, you know, they make sure that their client understands their rights. They make sure that the cops should, did their job right, that the, the trial is fair. You know, and they, they make sure that the Constitution is protected and they've done their job. And then you see lawyers that are fighting like this. You know, you know, something else is going on. You know, I right. mean, it's it's the biggest indicator from me as a defense attorney that that there's something to it. There's It's got teeth that they they you know, they don't fight this hard. They don't fight to get this hard back onto the case. You right. know what I'm saying? It's like if, if they know the case is a slam dunk loser. They're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, like, we're, off, we're off of it. Like, I'm not going, like, it's not my guy. You know, it's, he's not it's going not down on my walk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, there were just so many indicators to me that, you know, and it's definitely going to trial. There, there's absolutely no way he's pleading out. Like, there's zero chance of that. Zero, you know. And what we have to hope for now, and if I've seen a few people asking in the chats, you know, we're all concerned. I mean, none of us still know why he was moved. None of us. Right. No one knows why he was moved. Not, not his, not Brad and Andy, not Scrimmon and Labrado, you, Kathy. No one knows why he was moved. It, you know, three and a half hours away, right. which makes it, you know, he's got to be moved like immediately. He's got to be moved back some, like, He's got to be moved to Cass County, which is exactly where, where Brad and Andy wanted him to go immediately, where they said that they don't want him, but they can take him, you know, right. because it's convenient for them. Like in a case like this, you have to be able to communicate with your client. You just have to. Like this isn't the kind of case where you're sitting at your desk. Yes, you've got to obviously dig through the discovery, but they're past that at this point. Now they've been, they have to be able to communicate with their client. And so... You know, that's obviously pending. I'm assuming that Brad and Andy, especially because they adopted, uh, you know, their defense theory, as well right. as said that they felt that their first their first petition uh, to get them out was or to get them moved was had merit as well. I'm assuming they'll just adopt that and continue that fight to get to get Rick Allen moved into uh, somewhere that he's safer and so that they can have access to their client to prepare for trial, you know, but um, I like, so it's Friday night. You've been incredibly gracious with your time. I hope that you've been seeing all the love that you've been getting. I, from the chat. Been wonderful. Uh, I mean, and if you don't know, all of us, 
cats in the community that have been pulling for, you know, justice for a while, it, you know, this, we, we should all share in it. hundred so, percent. And, and, you know, I, I'm just so grateful for you and, and, you know, Mark, just, just cause you guys didn't have to do it. You know what I mean? You, did, you right. didn't have to do it. You did it to be a citizen, to be a, a you know, an American for the defense bar for Rick Allen, because <laughs> you saw something was going wrong. And, and you said, God damn it, I'm doing something about it. And, and you know what you did? You did something about it and you got an incredible result. And anybody who cares about the Constitution, anybody who cares about justice for the girls has to be thankful to you and Mark for what you did. And, and I know I certainly am. And I'm beyond impressed with you. You know, I'm a huge fan of yours. I think that you're a wonderful attorney. You're a credit to the profession. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm thankful that you exist on this planet. So, well, you know, thank you. Uh, that, that's it's been great being able to meet everybody and, and just be able to, I don't know, it's, it's fun to talk crime and criminal defense and all of that with people that, that understand. And, you know, I didn't do interviews with court TV or anybody like that. It wasn't, I don't know. I don't like doing interviews, but I, I definitely was willing to talk to you guys because I, you know, we, you already, we already speak the same language, right? I know, you know what right. it's like, so I don't have right. to explain, you know, what that feels like to go into a courtroom. And, you know, a lot of times people look at you like you're the defendant and that can be a very, um, <laughs> that, you have to grow a thick skin. Right. And I tell people all the time, sure. you just gotta, you, none of this is personal. Don't take anything personally. You just got to go in there and do your job and be the voice for those people that don't have a voice. Right. So. I mean, and it's just so much even <clears throat> more commendable because you did already have a really busy caseload <clears throat> and I know post-conviction and appellate work and it's research and it's post-convictions even like don't even get me started, <laughs> you know, but just like the amount of time and work and that you already had to take on, you know, something like this, it, it, it says a lot. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure your, your entire state bar has, you know, a lot to be thankful for you for, for doing that as does Richard Allen, obviously. Well, thank you. And I, I uh, definitely loved working with Mark and Maggie and Jesse and um, Jesse Cook actually did. She's sort of one of the criminal defense powerhouses in Indiana. She did a lot of background work with Brad and Andy that a lot of us, you know, didn't know about. So she's been there all along the way helping too. It's amazing how, how everybody kind of came together and, I can't speak highly enough about the people I've met through Twitter and these podcasts and being able to uh, just see that there are people out there that do care about this. Sometimes it feels like nobody cares, you know? And so uh, it's so great to know that there are people that do really like, you know, they believe in our system and they care about it. So they want this to. I know yeah. we're so used to feeling like we're yelling in a vacuum, like we criminal do. Like people, over here. You know, or, you know, you you hear it. I know you've heard it. How can you represent those people? How you know? Why would you try to get somebody guilty off? You know, and they just don't understand that that's not what that's not how we see it at all. You know what I mean? And so when you get to show people through a case like this that that's not what we're all about. That there's actually right. more that we do. It's a lot of fun to have. Yeah, people yeah. It. It's, so. it's amazing. I mean, you know, and Allison and I really dig into that aspect of trying to change people's perceptions of what it is that yeah, we I mean, do in this system. Fun, but yeah. Yeah, well, you know, but like, I'm forum, big on it. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great yeah. it's a great forum. And so I'd love to have you on. I'm gonna lock you in for when we get the opinion because I'd love for us to be able to go oh, through it together. It. Yeah. And just pontificate. And uh you know I'm also locking you in when this thing goes to trial, it's the three of us. Like if it's me sitting in there and then getting you guys intel or if it's us at night going through whatever, happened, whatever i want to handle do. it because we'll, yeah we'll have a blast with it and it, it's going to be it's going to be a fascinating case and i can't think of anything i'm going to jet that. when she jets and then you can answer the people's questions because you know i'm i'm working on stuff oh that's a good okay. yeah <laughs> yeah and, and 
you know, it's just, it, it, it's going to be a blast. So I'm locking you in on those two things. You're not going to be able to back good. out. <laughs> so the good. three of us will have a blast doing it and it'll be so fun. And plus, I love, love, love having an Indiana lawyer in here, you know, because it's every jurisdiction has its quirks. Every, every, oh, every state yeah. has its different Two statutes. out of three lawyers are women. Can't beat that. Can't beat oh, that. Can't know. beat that. Yeah, I really tried to stay quiet and just let you guys talk because that's the way I wanted it to be tonight. So I know it's hard. I for hope you. I was able to shut my mouth enough <laughs> to get you guys because people don't need to hear me all the time. You know, I read it so much. I'm like, God, Bob talks all the time. He just won't shut up. I wanted to hear Kara. So hopefully, <laughs> Kara, I, I, uh, I was quiet enough so the people could hear your brilliance. Um, you know, because again, me talking to her. yeah, I that's, love that. Hey, that's though. all right. I, that's great. Hey, listen, the, the if you know anything about the true crime community and, it, and especially our community that I've built with, with Jay and, and the public buzz guys and Joe Jackalone, it is women dominated, you know, it, just in general, women yesterday. love true crime. Yeah. It really is. And, and, you know, to have powerful, brilliant women, I'm no fool. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm all, I'm all about it. So it's like, and, and I, I adore both of you anyway i think you're both incredibly brilliant so um you know to not have you guys doing most of the talking would have been foolish on my part so i hope that uh i hope that that came through because i really wanted you guys to to talk pretty much the whole way without me interjecting too much so uh kara i again thank you so much for what you do congratulations on a spectacular spectacular win yesterday and i'm gonna ride it through you, the weekend <laughs> hell yeah you, know, you definitely should you should ride it right through the trial because you know what wow. if if rick allen gets acquitted and they they you know he ends up his life is saved you're a huge part of that we're gonna you know, have, you to have to know that. 70 days will be if they were to file like monday or something we'd have to we're looking at what march probably when oh. we're on jam cruise <laughs> oh yeah. when is that? It's You're end gone. of February. I think I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. Then we've got yeah. well, we got that other thing yeah. in Mexico. Oh, yeah, no. maybe we'll see. Well. No <laughs> business, business takes priority. It's family, then business, then vacation. Right. So <laughs> right. so all right, Kara, you're amazing. Everyone here adores you. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much. Thanks so much for, for having me. You. Of course, and for yes. case. it's been great. We're we're gonna ride this one out to the acquittal. All right, <laughs> all the way, baby. Out <laughs> Bye, babe. All right, ladies. Take, take care. Bye. All right, y'all. So, uh, oh, I keep she keeps adding her. Like she keeps adding herself. All right, y'all. Uh, let me see. I'm gonna go through real quick. I I was putting them up during uh during the uh the live, but I like to shout out the people that are super, super generous. Uh, Sandy with the $20 hollow. I got that. This is actually uh, a band that we love called Mr. Please. And this is one of their concert shirts. Um, and it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, so that's where I got that. Thank you for that $20 hollow. It's so, so generous of you. Uh, Chelsea, new member. Ah, oh, thank you so much. We love, we love new members. And by the way, we did our first YouTube for our Patreon or patrons uh, the other night. Our, our, our member only live is coming. I'm hoping to do it next week. So if you're not a member, go ahead and join. We're going to give you guys extra goodies, including lives. Um, one thing that I think I have going on, I'm trying to get... Uh, Susan Hendricks, she just started a YouTube channel and, you know, she's heavy duty into the case and, you know, she's got some opposing views. I think from me, I think it will be an interesting live to get her on. Uh, and, and it's a, and it's a different forum. I've been on core TV opposite of her. So we haven't really been able to like chat, like without any kind of guidelines or without Vinny streaming at both of us or, you know, interrupting us. So I'm looking forward to that. I think that'll probably be next week. Um, I hope to have another uh, Gacy. You know, 
I'm, I'm looking at how those lives do on here. You guys are sleeping on the Gacy thing. I know everyone's fascinated about Delphi, as am I, but you're sleeping on what we're doing with the Gacy thing and the search for additional victims. You just are. I'm just telling you. So maybe check those videos out there. They're there. Also, like and subscribe, y'all. That's what gets us out to the world. It gets the algorithm going. We think we're giving you some pretty good content. We think we're giving you some exclusive stuff. And, you know, we think that that we think that people like it. So spread the word. Help us do that. We're super appreciative because, you know, the community is everything. Without the community, we have nothing. Uh, $2 holla. Uh, KS Griffith, come on in. People love you. You, get, you have your own emoji. Say hi. Hi. Uh, we got another $5 holla from KS Griffith. The unraveling with a $5 holla. Thank you Dad, very why much. Why can't we play music? Nerdy and Eva. What do you mean? Like, we'll get copyright blasts. You can't play music. They can play music. Uh, they play like a very small clip. I think it's going to be under three seconds. It's going to be very, very short. Um, Nerdy and Eva, thank you for hanging. I couldn't slip the Russian in tonight, you know, uh, but I'll give it to you. I'll come back on your stream and give you the Russian if you're still here. Thank you guys very much for the, the kind donation. I appreciate it. True Crime Fangirl, $5 holla. Appreciate you. Eva, thank you very much. That's Eva of Dirty and Eva. Again, yeah. I'll, I'll bring I'll bring the heat with the, the Russian and all the accents, really. I do. I do many, many. Vo I'm a man of many voices. Meg P. Now, I saw you twice came through with 10, 10 memberships, gifted them to 10 lucky people who I saw were thanking her in the chat. Thank you so much for doing that. It's incredibly generous. We're incredibly thankful for you doing that because we're trying to build a community here. YouTube works. Two when, you, when you build a community, it's a $2 holla, say it. That's Gambies. I met Gambies in life, in real life yesterday. It was awesome to meet you. I felt bad because I kind of flaked on you, but, you know, things were moving quickly. But it was amazing to meet you, and thank you for that $2 holla. Debbie, what, what is that? Is that a $10 so holla? It's a $10 holla, if that's the way we say it. Ten Can you say it? Say it. $10 holla. <laughs> yeah. got to say it with feeling, though. Uh, uh Debbie, thank you very much for that generosity. We really appreciate it. Uh, Desiree, $5 holla. Followed it up with a $2 holla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dawn Burke with the $10 holla. Thank you. I hope I got to that question. We all want him out. We definitely got to get him moved. Uh, I mean, he, he's they're not going to give him bond, if, if that's what you're asking. But we got to get him out of prison. We got to get him into a county jail. Uh, I'm not buying this this BS that they can't keep him safe there. They can definitely keep him safe there. And uh, he's got to be close to his attorneys. Jen, thank you much. Uh, we appreciate you uh, so much. You're always here and you're always giving. Thank you so much for that $5 holla. And then Shelby, thank you much for another $5 holla. Appreciate you. Bonnie R, $5 holla. Gypsy Soul. I like it. It's a good one. $10 holla. Desiree D coming in hot again with another 10 bucks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob, you're one of the best travelers I've ever watched. Brains to me in her presence. Thank you so much. You met your match. Oh, I not only met my match, she aces me, man. Like, she's the brains of the operation. Like, followed up by a $5 dollar. Followed by a $5 dollar. But thank you so much for the, uh, the compliment. I definitely agree. Allie is super special. Um, Desiree, $5 dollar holla. A uh, question regarding something Mark said in his argument. I couldn't understand. Don't know what's the significance of his, rest, uh, his reference to Westerman's arrest. I think it was relating in, in terms of the leak because they kind of got into the leak. And I, I think that that was where he was leaning with respect to the significance of the rest of the reference because there had been a crime committed. You know, that the, the, this wasn't Andy just being, you know, like, completely and totally uh, oblivious to what was going on, Westerman went in there with a plan, and the plan was to get the evidence. For what reason, we still don't know. You know, we really don't know. And, you know, I mean, I have long thoughts on it, but in terms of what his motive was to get that, it couldn't have been to just spread it to, to you know, five or six creators. There had to have been, a like, a deeper, darker motive uh, you know, and I'm sure a lot of you out there are thinking the same thing. When I when I just think about who benefited this, oh, you, you can yell this one out. What do we get? What do we get? 
What do you get that? Well, you got to say it. What is it? A $50 holla. Wow, you're slipping, man. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Shiraz, thank you. Thank you so much for that incredible generosity. I wanted to make sure you saw this. Well, I definitely saw it. Uh, at Petty Riddle, you show me that it's not about getting people off. It's about making the prosecution prove their case in a fair trial. Truth and truth. Thank you for educating me and my view of defense attorneys. Thank you for being receptive. Like that's, that's the biggest thing about this is, you know, a lot of people, and I always tell people the biggest, the biggest joy that I get from doing this in the podcast is when I either see or hear or read when people are like, man, you've completely changed my view of defense attorneys. It means everything to me. It's, it's really what my purpose in doing this is and advocating for, for victims and, and just trying to educate you guys on how this system works and the realities of it. It's flawed, but it's still the best that there is, you know, and, and we saw it, we saw it yesterday. It's everything's hard in the law. There's no easy, easy way out. There's no easy answers. It's just one of those things where you have to, you have to keep fighting. And, and if you do, sometimes good things happen. Sometimes they don't. But, you know, you have to continue the fight. But thank you so much for that incredibly generous $50 holla. Uh, I hear circus music. I hear an amazing handle. <laughs> that, that is a great, great handle. Uh, thank you so much for that $25 super sticker, $25 holla. It's amazing. All right, Scott, I want you to try to say this one. So I feel like I'm Steve here on this one. Oh, am I, oh, am I boring you? Another great handle. Thank you so much for that $2 holla. That's amazing. All right. Uh, I'm jumping off here. If y'all aren't doing anything and you want to go hang with a couple of awesome guys, swing over to Publicly Buzzed. I meant to funnel you in or portal you in, and I forgot to do it, but they just started. Uh, they, or they may have started a little bit ago, but they'll still be going hot for Feral Friday. To all my mods, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for for doing what you you guys do. I, I just couldn't do this without you. I, like I don't even know what I'd be doing without mods. I'd be more more lost in the tech world than I already am. So thank you guys so much. I saw you in here, saw you crushing it like you always do. Uh, Jay, I saw you, brother. Thank you for popping in, man. Love you. Hope you and Shans are still celebrating. And also uh, our girl Shannon. She's got a live tomorrow, okay? And y'all need to be following her uh, because it's it's great stuff. So she's a part of our fam. Make sure if you haven't subscribed to Shannon's channel, make sure you do it now because it's great. I'm going to be popping in there tomorrow because I like I've been completely neglectful of her and her her channel, and she puts on great content. Plus, it sounds like she's got a really great great concept of what. Uh, what she's doing tomorrow. I'm like, I'm, she really piqued my interest. It's a good one. Um, so you guys definitely check out Shannon's channel. And of course, sub to Jay, Joe Jack alone, publicly buzzed and us because we really are building a community here and we love everybody that's a part of it. And mostly, more importantly, thank you. There's still 621 of you hanging in here. Without you guys, I'm literally, quite literally, just an old man. Talking about old cases. Nailed it. Talk to you next time. Peace. Peace out. Mata out. Mm -hmm.